I'm going to call the meeting to order this, this evening. Uh, this is the March 22nd meeting of the McHenry County Conservation District. With that, I will ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the introductory roll call, Megan. Trustee Gayton? Here. Trustee Cook? Here. Trustee Thomas? Here. Trustee Dom? Trustee Henning? Present. Okay, we have four trustees present. That's enough for a quorum. So we're, we're legal to go. We don't need anything for remote participation. Nobody's re participating remotely. Uh, conservation ethic. Uh, who would like to read that? Ray, thank you. Uh, conservation ethic goal number six to foster a conservation ethic among McHenry County citizens, helping all of us, regardless of the basis of our interest in nature, to develop a greater awareness of our role in and responsibility for the total community of life. A conservation ethic asks us to assume a moral duty to become educated about conservation issues and then to act upon that information. A conservation ethic is an attitude that recognizes the importance of preserving the natural heritage of the county's open space. Goal number two, to acquire and maintain other wildland scenic areas and open spaces for conservation purposes and for educational and recreational use. Thank you. Reading the Conservation Stewardship Pledge. Uh, Bill, would you do that one, please? We pledge to make a difference by standing up for our water, wildlife, and way of life in McKinley County. The quality of life in McKinley County is on healthy and sustainable natural resources, thoughtfully developed cities and towns, a strong economy, and beautiful outdoor places to explore, discover, and recreate. Help to build a sustainable and vibrant local economy by providing a destination for outdoor recreation experiences. I would have a motion to adopt the agenda. I'll move we adopt the agenda. Bill has the motion, Ray has a second uh, roll. Um, Jesse Thomas? Yes. Trustee Dayton? Yes. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Henning? Yes, motion is a, the agenda is approved and the agenda has been adopted. Okay, well, then we have an introduction of a new team member, Police Officer Patrick Donahue. Uh, Elizabeth, are you going to do the honors or? Well, I'm going to turn it over to Laura, Laura King. She, okay. King is online and we've got Patrick in the boardroom. So, Hello. Officer Donahue. Yes, I, I, can you guys hear me? I seem to be having a little trouble with my connection. You guys got me? Oh, great. Okay, fantastic. So I know Patrick is there uh, with you tonight since he was on shift. We thought he would pop in and say hello in person. Uh, so for the most part, I would like Patrick to be able to introduce himself, but I would just like to say that we are so happy because with the onboarding of Patrick, we are finally up to full staff, which is a place that we have not been in about two and a half years. And so it's so exciting to be going into the summer of 2022 with, um, a full team uh, at the police department. So uh, Patrick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Again, my name is Patrick Donahue. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the executive director and Chief King for giving me this opportunity to continue to serve. Previous three years, I was with the McHenry County Sheriff's Office and then I was with the Chicago Police Department for 21 years. So I'm excited to continue my law enforcement career in McHenry County and Looking out that window right now says it all. It's uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. I'm here. Um, that's that's great. So welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have recognition of Eric Lindstrom, our Park Ranger One. Uh, 
who is doing a carry uh, on that one. Does Mr. Young cover that? I can cover it or carry. We, we're just, uh, many team members are taking the plunge here to continue with their professional development. And Eric took the upon himself to be certified as a park and recreation professional. So we have multiple team members that have gone through this. This is the second one for the year with this certification. So congratulations to Eric. And uh, I don't know if he's with us this evening. I didn't see him, but uh, again, appreciate he's a ranger assistant. So um, glad to have him with us. So park ranger one now, we changed everything here. So, uh, <laughs> we, we challenged the, the staff to, you know, to look at professionally developing themselves. And uh, Eric stepped up and, and went out and get it. It's not easy to get. Um, it's some studying off, off time. And so uh, he's got that certification. And there must be about 10 of us at the district that have that. So what, who does the certification? It's through the National Park and Rec Association. NRPA does it. Okay. Yeah. So there's standards that you have to adhere to. And then once you obtain the certification, then you have to maintain continuing education units uh, every two years. Otherwise, you lose your certification. Okay. So uh, it's a commitment for professional development in all the areas that cross the entire organization, not just within your particular area of study. Very good. Congratulations, Derek. He's not with us? He's not with us. All right, with that, I'll move on to trustee report. Anybody have anything they need to report right now? Okay, Excellent. we'll move on to county board liaison. So um, it's been really busy. Hold on, I'm moving. Okay, it's been really busy. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. That'll, that'll pick you up. All right, try it again. Uh, at the county, we've had a lot going on. So as you know, your budget was approved unanimously last month. It wasn't even pulled for discussion. It just passed easily. So they know you're doing good work there. Um, so a couple of things that are going on, Randall Road was a, awarded $8 million in a federal bill to continue expansion north from where they just ended at Acorn all the way up to where it's three lanes again. So they'll get started working on that soon. Um, we passed a resolution giving $800,000 to a firm that's going to develop um, low-income housing in McHenry. So that would be, it's much needed how low-income housing we Last time there was a study done, there was only three rental apartments available in the city of McHenry. So I think that's um, much needed. And they're using, they're rehabbing uh, existing historic structures and using a lot of green energy. Um, then what else? We are also in the middle of phase two of putting out requests for, for expression of interest to internet providers. So because we're expanding our um, Broadband, high-speed fiber around the west and the north of the county. And so that's going along. Uh, the board passed a resolution for leasing body uh, cameras for five years. And they should be deployed by midsummer. They integrate with the cameras that are in the um, car, the dash cams. But right now, the dash cams, because supply chain issues, won't be until the end of the year. But pretty soon, everything will work together. Uh, I was very happy to be sitting with the Conservation District at the Environmental Annual, Annual Dinner, and I brought my daughter, and we had a great time talking to Tom Scaling at the end. He, he was very, oh, he talked a lot, didn't he? He was very personable, and he talked to every single person. We kind of had to stop him to talk, and it, it was wonderful. Um, all petitions have been submitted for anybody running for elected office. So you should know who is running in your districts now if you go to the clerk's website. There, I talked to Pete Austin today. There have been 12 applications for the open seat on the board. And does, that, does that close? Today. today? Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm sure um, I would say in the next couple of weeks, we'll start interviews. That's up to Chairman Bueller when we'll do it. Anything else here? Oh, emergency management, just so you guys know, is working hard to mitigate any threats about cyber attacks. You know, with the threats between Russia and Ukraine, they're, they're being very diligent about that. Water Resource Department is working with other entities to develop the Illinois SALT smart training and certification for parking lots and sidewalks. The Zoning Board of Appeals will hear an application for a second utility scale park 
farm, solar farm. So that'll be a, another large one. I don't have any more details about where it is or anything, but I just saw that on the notes today. And that's really about it. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just ask, yeah, maybe Diane, for your board or for our board, what are our applications? For Gosh. your board, there were 12 or 12. And I knew there were more people interested in, you really? know, once they heard there were that many, they didn't. Perfect. Very good. All right. I don't have anything that I need to report at this time. Um, so that brings us to public comments. Uh, Stephanie, there anybody from the public wanting to speak? No, there's not. Okay. Thank you. And uh, that brings us to Linda. You'd like to make a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Starting with 12.1, approval of minutes of previous meetings. 12.1A, February 17, 2022, Committee at the Whole. 12.1B, February 22, 2022, regular monthly. 12.1C, January 13, 2022, regular meeting executive session. 12.2, acceptance of the treasurer's report. 12.2A, 2, 28, 20, 2022. 12.3, resolution number 20. 2 16, the resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a memorandum of understanding with open lands for mutual assistance on prescribed burns on properties owned and or managed by open lands within the county county. 12.4, resolution number 22 17, a resolution awarding a contract to the lowest and responsible bidders as follows by Buffalo Nurse, Nursery of Richmond, Illinois, at 47.48 per hour person per hour for per hour person per hour for backpack herbicide application and $87.48 for herbicide application with an ATV moving sprayer for a cost not to exceed $5,000 for project number six. Arts Road Fen and RES Great Lakes LLC of Broadhead, Wisconsin for $54.50 per person per hour for backpack herbicide Application and $75 for herbicide application with an ATV boom sprayer for a cost not to exceed $80,000 for project number one, Kishwaukee Corridor, project number two, Alden Gap Wetland Mitigation, project number three, Goose Lake Eskers, project number four, Elizabeth Lake Nature Preserve, project number five, School Springs Wetland Mitigation Bank, and project number seven, Camp Dakota, bid number 0222. <coughs> Dot 08 dot 01. 12.5 authorization to prepare spe specifications and that bids <coughs> for Prairie Trail stormwater repairs between Springwood <coughs> Road and Barnard Miller Road in Springwood, Illinois, bid number 0322.09.03. authorization to prepare specification and that bids for the Prairie Trail renovations Route 120 to Macomb Lake Road in Henry, Illinois. Bid number 0322.09.01. 12.7 authorization to prepare specifications and let bids for Prairie Trail stormwater repairs. South Barn, Barnard Mill Road, Ringwood, Illinois. Bid number 0322.09.02. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> All right, short. I'll start. Bill has a second. A roll call. Yes. Trustee Yes. Trustee Thomas. Yes. Trustee Henning. Yes. Motion is approved. Okay. Very good. Brings us to other board business. Approval of bills um, for the month of February 2022. We don't have a treasurer here tonight. Ray, would you like to work us through these? Uh, sure. Um, treasurer's internal audit. Three point. Sorry. 13.1A, Treasurer's Internal Audit. Um, I yeah, have I two. You did? I or, did. No, 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 no. I okay. have two. Okay. A661, Albertsons for $50.67, and I7740, Imports Unlimited, and I don't have the amount. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, did you pull in? Okay, so those are the two we have pulled, so we'll be fine. Okay, go ahead, Lydia. 
uh, 13.1B consideration to approve the payment to conserve FS as indicated on the submission of bills pending report for the period ending February 28, 2022. Yes, the motion or second? Second. Uh, Linda, can we have a second on this one? Uh, roll call. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Hayden? Yes. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Honey? I'll abstain. Motion carries three in favor, more abstention. Okay. Motion. Motion. Uh, consideration to approve the payment of the balance of bills as indicated on the submission of bills pending report for the month ending February 28, 2022. Bill, would you like to second that? I'll second. Thank you. We'll call. Trustee Gayton? Yes. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Hennie? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, 13-2. Uh, the request to purchase the steep stream bank credits, uh, school, spring, wetland, and stream mitigation bank. Uh, who is leading us through that one? Well, I just want to, tonight we moved, it could have been a consent agenda, but this is the first sale of our mitigation bank. And I want to compliment and just give a shout out to our team at Land Preservation and Natural Resources and Finance and Accounting for working through this, uh, specifically at Collins, Kate Powers, Brad Woodson, Dal Seiler, and then Amy Dylek, who served on the review team here. So, and anything else from your team you want to add to this? Well, it's been a long time coming. It feels good. Did <laughs> they go about as you thought it would? Um, you know, the first time through, we just wanted to make sure we had all the paperwork in order, and um, Val and other members of the team really worked hard on that. Uh, we did get a surprise when uh, we got a check dropped off um, here to to the board meeting. So uh, all all good, and we have the procedure down, and we have several other uh, organizations interested in purchasing credit. So hopefully we'll be sending some more your way soon. How long do you think it'll take to sell everything out? Well, we can use all small percentage this first year and we may very well sell all the rest of the stream credits and some of the wetland credits this year. Mm -hmm. So as you meet standards, you can sell more and more credits and we're moving along I see. Uh, in that direction. Good. So it's uh, just uh, approximately what will the what revenue will the sale of 327 linear feet of stream credits produced. I'm just under $200,000. And the team that was out there doing the restoration work, obviously, and I will forward on if I have not, um, there's a regular annual report that's provided to the Army Corps of Engineers. It's very comprehensive. It talks about the progress and of the, of the work that's being done. Great job, I well, very good. Congratulations. That's that's great. Do you have a question? I don't. Okay. Uh, so we need a motion to uh, I think cash that check basically. Um, to, to approve that. So the check's been sitting here a while. So uh, could I have a motion to? Well, what's basically right? I make that motion. So that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. May has a second. Uh, have, uh, any more discussion? And roll call. Trustee Dayton? Yes. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Honey? Yes. Motion carries and we're good to go. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next resolution 13.3. Um, so we do have a presentation tonight on the hunting program. Gabe is with us. He is remote. He's on vacation, but he dialed in, but he pre recorded his message. So if technology works for us, we're going to give it a try here. I'm going to try and do it uh, remotely here. Gabe, it's up to you. I'm going to try it one more time. Okay. I'm afraid we're going to get feedback. Well, at the end, we're going to talk about technology. So this is exciting. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs>
I looked at the uh, material that was in the packet, and there certainly were a number of letters commending the program. And it appears like we're satisfying a hundred or so there. Good so you're ready? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Okay. All right. So tonight, I uh, just wanted to do a quick discussion about the history of the program, where the program has been, how we got to where we are here today, and then at the end, just have an opportunity for discussion on where the board would like to have this program go in the future, and specifically addressing how we use technology from this point on. Next one. So my next slide is going to be a picture of some some waterfall hunters. And if you're with me, two years ago uh, for the board presentation, I talked about the uh, kid in footy pajamas and how they were pulled out of their bed and uh, pulled out into this dark experience. And they're cold and they really didn't want to go. But then the sun came up and they heard the noises, and smelt the smells, and experienced all that um, the the outdoors provided and talked about how hunting isn't for everyone, but it certainly does plant the seeds of conservation in the hearts of, of some people. So that's kind of the benefit of the recreational aspect of the hunting program. Next slide talks about the uh, hunting program. You saw this last year. In last year's presentation, I explained how the program analysis and report is a static report, but all the different interactions that take place in order to provide you guys that annual report each year and all the different in individuals and departments within the district that uh, are responsible for bringing this program, um, implementing it each year. Next one. And then the actual value of the deer hunting program, uh, you can see in the picture on the right, that is an exposure before district had a hunting program. You can see all those white flowers, those are shooting stars where the deer uh, were not browsing them. And then you can see outside the exposure, there's one or two flowers. So th this program has always uh, the question of how much does it cost, what the benefit is. And two years ago in the presentation, I provided this $5 per plan installed. That's the going rate for an actual plug, not a seed. And if you assume that there's one plant per square foot and you have the acreage figure there, you get up to $43,000 of vegetation per acre. Um, and that comes out to $200,000 per acre minimum asset. And if you multiply that by 10,000 acres and that's the amount that the hunting program has an impact on, you're looking at a $2 billion asset. You could say, you could argue, yes, there's not uh, one quality plant per square foot, but I would actually argue that that figure was probably low because of all the different ecological interactions that take place when you remove a species or a suite of species, their impacts are rippled across the entire ecosystem. And then if we're actually talking about species of special concern, that value of $5 goes up much higher because a lot of those species are irreplaceable. So for the actual cost of the asset protection, I think the $2 billion figure is fair. Next one. So the next few slides here, I'm just gonna go over the history of the program, how we got to where we are today and uh, all the different aspects of the changes specifically to the deer program and how we have used data to change the program over time. Next one. Looks like I missed the slide there. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so the program started in 2001, and each one of these bars represents the number of sites hunted. And then for each column, uh, the color is a different type of hunting that occurs. So from 2001 to 2004, we had the typical program expansion started off small, hunted one site. The second year had the archery one month hunt and a firearm site. And then right around 2005, we started doing uh, more deer management types of uh, hunting. 
we brought in the deer reduction program for the first time and the deer reduction program was in the southeast part of the county. So the next slide, I'll go through the whole history of the southeast part of the county, but we had high deer population there and um, also high public use. So this was a new initiative for the district. You can also see in 2005, we did the first combination hunt. That was a trial year. We perfected it and you'll see it in later slides. We brought it back later. Another thing that happened in 2006 uh, was we started bringing in the full season. We were beginning to have a meeting of herd goals, so actual population goals. And one thing that's been really enjoyable about my time with this program is just being able to change the program and move it around based on human dimensions, human dynamics, and, and try and place our people where they're gonna be the most effective. So when we had a full month season, we went, excuse me, to when we had a full season, we applied those where there's four deer, 40 deer per square mile. When there's a one month season, we applied those where there's 80 deer per square mile. And the reason with, with that is because the average hunter, uh, human dynamics is they're only gonna take two deer. Once they have two deer, they're done for the season. So if you have a population that needs to be reduced, if you get additional hunters in there, there's a better chance of bringing that population down. Next slide. <clears throat> this is just a quick summary of the east side deer reduction hunt and how we changed it over time. In 2005, we started off with 14 days on three sites. Those are Lions Prey, Hickory Grove, Silver Creek. In 06 to 09, we had one site that was the end of October, Felpro, and then three sites that were the first part of November. Again, Hickory Grove, Lions Prairie, Silver Creek. In 2010, we had four sites that were nine days, and then we had Felpro, which was two and a half months. In 2011, we did one site, nine days, sticking run, and then we had four sites that were two and a half months. And you'll see that this is the only time that we did the two and a half months because that was not received well from the public because of the amount of public use that was lost down in those uh, highly, highly popular sites. So you won't see two and a half months. From there on out, it's mostly nine days. The exception is starting in 2016, we went back to the two month, and then last year, you might remember that we got rid of some of those nine days and went to full season where we could. And then we moved uh, those areas that were not impacted by public trails from nine day to a full season. Next slide. 2009 to 2013, we start hitting a cap in the program and our enforcement team said, hey, we're expanding too quickly. We need to have a certain number of zones. So they provide the program managers the level of zones that could be effectively monitored and enforced from a public safety perspective. So from here on out, you'll see a lot of modifications to the actual types of programs that are applied in the landscape. The first trend you're gonna see is the firearm sites get reduced. So from 2009 to 2011, we go from five sites down to three, and you'll see that the combo hunts start replacing them. So those areas where we can safely apply the combo program, and again, as a reminder, the combo program is both archery and firearm. So it's a, a higher quality hunt. We had more of those sites take over. And then also you can see we changed some of the one month to, and two and a half months in archery fold. There's a lot of variation in these years as we move things around and try to see what the impact of uh, the human dimensions were to our, our deer management. Next slide. All right, <clears throat> 2014, we tried something uh, very unique. We were seeing that we had the high demand. People were starting to not get into the program. And we also took a look at the hours. And what you saw was there's a bias towards the beginning of the hunting season and the hours kind of slowly taper off. You can see that in the annual report to this day, you have October hours, they peak in November and they fall off hard. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the decrease in daylight. Uh, the deer aren't as easily accessible. You have to hunt a little bit smarter. So what we did is in 2014, we took a look at that data and we split the season. So we had an early season group and then a late season group. So instead of a one month, we 
went early season, late season. And what that did is it increased the hours throughout all months, October through January. But there was this perception that there was a loss in quality because that late season group were at the mercy of how the group before them hunted. So we didn't go back to that, even though the uh, predicted results were what we wanted. There was this perception of quality and we wanted to maintain a, a high quality hunt. So you'll see from 2014 on, we're going to increase our full season hunt because that was deemed the highest quality. And in order to meet the demand, we started requiring, not requiring, but we provided preference to groups of three. That means that a group of three would get in before a group, a group of two and a group of two would get in before a group of one. So that's what you see in 2016, where we have the three preference. That's what that uh, is referencing. The only other thing I'd mention in 2016, if you look at the, the right here, we have seven different types of deer hunting. Some of the feedback from our enforcement team was, hey, if you could boil this program down so it doesn't have as many variations, that'd be a whole lot easier for our enforcement. So you'll see that become implemented in uh, future years. Next slide. <clears throat> so from 2017 to last year, you can see our trend. We're trending up, providing the highest quality opportunities that we can. Uh, as we mentioned last year, we did that conversion. So we got rid of all the late season opportunities and converted them to full season where we could. The only one that we couldn't convert to uh, from, from late season to full season was, was Brookdale because of the trail. So that is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that's that one little bar on the far right. <clears throat> everything else got trained, changed to full season, either combo or full season archery, other than the reduction hunt that we've mentioned previously. Next slide. The other thing that's occurring is our, our demand is increasing greatly. Uh, we have <laughs> more and more applicants each year. You can see from this graph, from 2017 to last year, we've almost doubled the amount of applicants. And what that does is create not only demand, but also a lot, uh, a lot of impact on us to manage the program, to, to manage the data specifically. Next slide. So with that, you probably saw this in the annual report, but the committee recommendations specific to the hunting program were to add two combo zones at the Kish corridor. And again, the combo is the archery and firearm. And that is a replacement of removing two zones at high point. The reason we're removing those zones, even though there's demand is because the, the committee has had a procedure that when we would allow calling, we wouldn't have deer hunting. And again, it goes back to that perception of quality. There's this antagonistic tension between calling and hunting and we find it best just to remove that tension uh, by, by having opportunities elsewhere. So we wanted to have the state go in there and do some calling because of the increase in prevalence at that site. And then we're also proposing to add three new archery zones, one at Boone Creek. Boone Creek would be just north of the state IDNR site at Gallabrath. They have a public hunting program there and we would just be on the north side of that. The one at Pleasant Valley is in the southeast part of the site, away from the public trails. The public trails are north and central. This would be in the southeast corner. And one at Alden Gap on Ferris Road. The other recommendation from the committee is to eliminate the cap on group size. So previously, I mentioned that we had the preference for three partners. And with that, we had a cap that you could only have up to three adult partners. If you had it, if you had three adult, excuse me, three youth, you could go up to six, but a maximum three adult partners. And some of the feedback you may have seen in the questionnaires was uh, to, to eliminate that cap specifically for families. We had a couple of families that said, hey, grandpa wants to hunt, but he's only gonna hunt two days. Or we have a college kid, they wanna hunt, but they're only gonna hunt one week. Is there a way to eliminate this cap? 
And with the demand that we're having, we thought this would be a good idea to eliminate this cap so we have more group size. Because otherwise, what would happen is you'd have to split these families and then you'd have two groups that would be taking up a zone. So instead of us mandating this cap, we decided that it would be best for the groups to self-regulate. They know what the zones are ahead of time and they're gonna be more familiar with the aspects of their group than we are. So that's why we are recommending that elimination. The one caveat to that would be, we would not provide any more preference for partners. So you'd still have that three max for partner preference. What we didn't wanna to have to start happening is people manipulating our system just to get a spot and have all sorts of people come in that wouldn't hunt. So three people would be the max, but they could have as many people as they want. And then we also are recommending an increase in the archery combo zone fees of $100. And what that means is if I'm a group of three residents, it would be an increase of $33 for a resident and $66 for a non-resident because non-residents pay a double. The last time that we had an archery fee modification was in 2006 for reference. So as we just discussed, the quality of the program has increased over time, and we would like to capture some of those quality increases, but also looking towards future investment in technology. Next. <clears throat> the data management of the hunting program over time has been, uh, in 2004, you can see we went from paper to the first access database. In 2011, the program moved from administration to LPNR. In 2014, we brought in our first online application. Previous to that point, it was all done by paper. The second version of access database was in 2014. We switched the district switch. It wasn't just the hunting program. The district switched from active net to excuse me, active tech to active net in 2016. Uh, we also had the GIS upgrade there. In 2019, this is this is a big one. We moved away from paper sign-in. So from 2001 to 2019, we used boxes and there was paper in the boxes, and there was wasps in the boxes, and there was mice in the boxes. It was, it was a mess. Uh, some of our data sheets, we know that they were missing. You'd see a trend in data go up all the way through October, right into the prime time. All of a sudden, none of the hunters hunt. That's clearly a loss in the sheet there. So our, our data management improved greatly in 2019. In 2020, one last thing about 2019, we did this WUFU system, which was uh, online forms that uh, Stephanie set up. And we believe in shooting bullets before cannonballs. That's a, a Jim Collins thing. So just, just trying to figure out where we're going with technology so that WUFU was really a, a bullet, no pun intended with the hunting program. But in 2020, we invested, the foundation invested $10,000 in this huntmccd.org website. And what that is, is a mobile friendly website. The customer experience Moving from paper to WUFU was good because they, the hunters also didn't like paper, but the WUFU forms was complicated. Moving to the huntmcc.org site, we increased the customer experience. All of their data management is within their own login. Previously, they had to check in in one website and then check out in another, but this centralized everything for them. So, so that investment was specifically for the customer experience. Next slide. This is a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the previous slide, the GIS upgrades. GIS has uh, improved their dashboarding. And so the LPNR department will be moving to a GIS spatial dashboard for the board and executive leadership team to uh, visualize all the spatial management that occurs. So previously you heard me talking about sites and I put together all those graphs. With this one in particular, this is just a screenshot, but at some point the board will be able to interact in this, interact with this dashboard in the central, you can see the map. You guys could zoom in and out to those sites and see exactly where the hunting program is, where it's not, where 
different types of hunting is. And you can see on the, the pie chart in the top left there, previously I was talking about sites, but those were the actual zones. So you can see where the zones are on the landscape. So although we have 18 full season sites, what that equates to is the 54 full season deer archery zones. Next. Oh, one last thing about this one, the 9,400 acres, I rounded up to 10,000. So if you go back to that, that $2 billion figure, that's where I, I got that from was this dashboard. <clears throat> so the committee, we discussed our data management, our, our costs, uh, staff costs are increasing annually. Our, like I mentioned previously, our hours have doubled since the zone cap. Uh, Actually, I didn't mention that. Our application has doubled since 2017. I showed you that. But our hours, the actual hunting hours, because of all the different modifications that we've done with the program, even though we've been at the cap, our hunting hours have doubled since 2009. So we're applying people to the landscape in a way that we're getting more hunter effort. And we're also capturing their um, inputs better. So we're managing twice as much data than we have since 2009. So the committee's recommendation was to invest in data management technology and specifically an additional investment in the mobile friendly website, not for the customer, but for the staff so that we would have a police dashboard. And what a police dashboard would provide is an officer would be able to come in on any day and they would get similar to the type of dashboard that you just saw, but an output, a daily output of where the hunters are, hunting at the time where the harvests are occurring, and then they can plan their um, enforcement, their checks based on current data. Currently what they have to do is they have to go in and take a look at each customer where they don't actually have an output. So it would be an increase in quality for the enforcement team. And then it also remove all the manual processes for LPNR, specifically our GIS analyst. Uh, as you may recall, we, we removed uh, some staffing levels at LPNR. We don't have as much data management. So I would like to remove some of these hours of manually moving data around from our GIS analyst. <clears throat> After the discussion from the committee recommendation, we evaluated potential other options. Again, going back to that concept of shooting bullets before cannonballs. This program is at a point where we could invest in a cannonball if the board saw fit. When this technology movement happened about eight years ago, my vision was this program needs an app. It needs an application, it can be done on the phone, and you probably have seen the hunters comments. They said, this is great, it'd be better if it was an app. And that's where we do need to go eventually. If the timing may not be now, but we could investigate other options, including app creation. Uh, the GIS analyst told me that GIS survey one, two, three could be an option or possibly a GIS native app. So I just wanted to have a conversation with the board to see what, uh, what their feelings were whether we should invest in additional staff time to evaluate our technology, if we should go with the committee recommendation for the additional investment at huntmcc.org, that I did get a quote on that, it was $15,000, or if we should go towards app creation, which may be the best, and we may be time to shoot that cannonball. Next slide. So with that, I'd really appreciate the board's time. Uh, again, this, this program has been great to manage. I, I really enjoy seeing new people, new generations coming out and join the natural resources. I've been able to be involved in non-hunters, meeting hunters and finding common ground and tearing down walls that previously existed. And with that, I would uh, just open it up for discussion on the app but also recommendations for next year's program, which was the first set of recommendations on those zones. Board members have questions? I have a question. I have a question. Uh, you've got a quote for 
unit, then you kind of ballpark figure out. Okay. I can't hear him. Oh, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Um, uh, so you got a quote for 15K to for huntmccd.com upgrade. Did you get any sort of quote for what it would cost to do an ask for, you know, with everything that you want in it? Previously, the ballpark was around 50,000. I did not go out for quotes. I figured that it'd be better to have this discussion. My expectation after this discussion is, is the board will say, hey, let's, let's look at these different avenues. And then we would come back and, and look at a more detailed analysis of what each option would cost. But 50,000 is, is my idea of a ballpark, but that is not grounded. Uh, Cindy may know better. So what you're looking for is for the, the board of trustees to just say, yeah, go out and do the investigation on these three options and then uh, report back uh, to have some more discussion on that where you want to go with this. Essentially, I think there's a step before that is, is should we continue to invest, invest in technology? That would be the first one. If yes, okay, then should we go back and, and, and do a thorough analysis to invest staff time in, in all of these options, or should we go with the hunt mccd.org option? Um, but the first one is, should we continue this investment in technology? I'm not sure I have anything intelligent to say because I'm not a hunter and I, and I don't understand exactly the types of data that you you need to run the program. Um, it's, the foundation made a donation for this mccd.org program. You've been using it for how long? And, Two seasons. And do you find that it is inadequate? The, the, the district's website is adequate for the customer. So the customer, their experience increased. That, that functioned well. So the, the foundation invested in that program and that works well for the customer. It doesn't work well for administration, the districts, us internally. So what you need is something to piggyback on top of that, or, um, or is it, um, you know, you sort of want to start from zero and develop an application or um, technology that <clears throat> serves both the customer and the staff. And is Correct. that the question? Yes, yeah, that's... Yes, right now, what we're doing, so there is a technology option out there that the district staff does not need to manually move data back and forth each year. So, so the one-time investment of building the system would provide savings over time. So there's two, there's, I don't want to say there's two routes. There's two routes that I'm currently biased towards, and that would be the app and the huntmcc.org. But I have yet to invest additional staff resources, our resources, in evaluating all those other options that were laid out previously. Does that make sense? How much staff time are you hoping to uh, cut back? I mean, how many dollars are we hoping to save through, through staff time? The LPNR side is probably around 80 hours annually. I do not know, uh, maybe. Laura could help out with what the enforcement would be. I, I don't know what the officers are doing currently and how much time they're spending going through each line. I just heard their feedback on what the vision would be. So if we're gonna change something, we would wanna have that program, not just do what LPNR needs, but the entire district business. If you're gonna change something, you should change everything. It's gonna be cheaper to do it at, the, at one time. Does that make sense? Yes. So 
I think what the board would look for is is what what do you think the savings would be, what the cost would be, and what you know what the annual savings and the annual costs would be um, going forward. If we could have something in that kind of uh, just to get us started, then we could like go from there. Well, so this is Laura. So I would say from the police side of things, um, that that answer really truly depends. So what this app is is going to do is not so much uh, save us time. It's going to improve the functionality of our ability uh, to monitor the program proactively to ensure the safety and the compliance of all the participants. And so. It's really difficult to man uh, to to put place value right on, on safety, and I know you're looking at like well how many how many hours. So what I would say is it's going to save the police department between five thousand and ten thousand dollars a year in manpower hours uh, by streamlining streamlining lining and improving our efforts uh, to be able to integrate with the program in a smarter way. And when we work smarter. Uh, instead of harder, you know, we don't waste our times uh, doing things that uh, the long way, right? Instead, we, we kind of take the, the fast and efficient route. And so uh, you guys all know me, right? I, I too hold a bias. I want to work smarter and not harder. And I am fully supportive of leveraging technology to help us. And I think that's especially important in this day and age when, um, you know, our, our workforces are, are stressed and we, you know, just had this big conversation about uh, how do we value employees and I think that giving them the tools that they need to do their job so that it can be an efficient operation instead of a labor intensive operation that type that adds value not only to the management of this program but also to, to the totality of the different tasks that our police officers are involved in. So from a police perspective, I definitely would be um, supportive of either investment. Like Gabe said, the investment in mcc.org is a next natural step forward. The investment in the app is kind of, you know, moving to the big solution at the end of the road. So, you know, do we do we want to enjoy the ride or do we just want to get to where we're going? I think is, is really... Um, you know, what, what the board has to consider. Hey, um, Gabe, do you have anything else to add to that? That was a good summary. Is the board's consensus that we let them at least investigate and get that report back to us? Is that what you're hoping for is just a consensus right now to um, forward yeah. and uh, yeah, definitely. I don't. I don't want to waste taxpayer funds doing something that the, the board wouldn't ultimately at least be interested in hearing. So I, I don't want to spend staff time going through all these evaluations, figuring out options, and then saying, "Ah, we don't really want to invest in technology." So, so if there is a consensus, yes, we should evaluate this. We think it's valuable to the program and the district. I, I think that would be step one. I'm comfortable with that. Uh, um. I, I think, you know, we, we, I don't think any time that staff investigates something and gives us more facts to deal with it, it's ever a waste of time. I mean, there might be a, it, you may come, we may come to a conclusion at the end that maybe isn't what you want, but um, generally we're, I think we're all open-minded and we want to, we want to hear what staff's uh, best recommendation is and and uh and you may not come to the same conclusion you think you're going to at this point in time either even though you are a little biased but um you, you will uh I, i'm sure you'll treat this fairly and you'll come back to us with what we need to know and we can have that conversation then absolutely All right very good i i um so i think we're all in consensus there so we have a head in there then i changing the subject you have a question so do you think that your numbers are being managed uh, to where they need to be? That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> how long do we how long do we have here? We're doing a we're doing a great job, and and specifically if you take a look, I hate to do comparison because I think what we have is is the best. But if you look at what the cost of agencies around us 
are inputting for managing deer and specifically protecting that capital asset, excuse me, that natural asset, I, th I think we're doing a good job. Are there areas that we would like to harvest more deer? Absolutely. Are there areas that uh, we are doing a fantastic job? Absolutely. But it's, it's an ebb and flow. They're constantly move, moving. Anytime that there's a refugia on the landscape specifically, we, we see those deer just suck into those locations very quickly. Refugia being no, no impact from hunting or human influence. That's a quick answer. Okay, that's, I, I just was wondering if you had a baseline anywhere, you had some idea of where you're at, where you're going, and, and if, if yeah. the program is uh, uh, getting us where we want to be. I would think so, specifically when we talk to our botanists who have seen these species recover over time. Well, as a farmer, I can tell you it impacts me also. The, your dollars are probably not, uh, didn't look like you'd taken into account uh, consideration what what damage I see coming out of district property that I border if if it's if the population isn't managed properly has has that improved based on your assessment? Uh, yeah, what I'm farming I've seen probably uh, I think an adequate number of deer, but not as overpopulated as the once was. Good to hear. That's what I'm seeing. Anyone else have any further questions? I, I do. I do need direction on those previous recommendations, not the data recommendations, but the actual zones, because we're. I'm going to be sending the board the directive next month. So if so, if the board is in favor of those previous recommendations, you will see them in the April directives. That was the the modifications: Kish Corridor, High Point, Boone Creek, Alden Gap, Pleasant Valley. Is that part of a resolution here or not part of a resolution? Well, tonight you're accepting the report, which is a look oh, back at the last year. But it's not the- It's not the directive. It's a directive. Right. It was just the consensus on the, the So I haven't, does anybody have any, any difficulty with what was also asking for you? I certainly don't. In other words, uh, I, I think Gabe, you and your team are the experts in this. And, so uh, if this is but what, the way you read the numbers and the direction you think you should uh, tweak the program as far as access and hours and, and the types of funds, um, <clears throat> no, I think um, I would support your recommendation. Oh, and that's, I think is everybody's good with your recommendations and look forward to your, you know, next month with any feedback you have. Um, are you getting many, are you getting much pushback from the public in very many places or just a few? Well, 2020 was an odd year. Uh, you probably saw in those hours, 2020 was off the charts and it wasn't just off the charts for for hunters we had more public in the zones than we ever have had previously and that that continued again in 2021 but not to the extent that it was in 2020 the officers are very busy dealing with uh public and hunter interactions but i think it, it helped quite a bit just just changing a lot of those zones from from where the public has open space and having hunting on the periphery. So really demarcating, this is the public open space and this is where the hunting occurs. Uh, that has been a, a, a big program change that we went from in 2020 to 2021 and it seemed to have helped. That's okay. only one, one year of observation though. All right. I, I think everyone's on board with your recommendations and would like to see that move forward. I'm not seeing anybody with a negative view at that point. Thank you. Thank you for all the effort on this. It, it, I think it's a great program. With that, if there's no more questions, I would entertain a motion, somebody to make a motion for resolution number 22-19, a resolution accepting 
the 2021 hunting report and consensus to support the recommendation for the 2022 hunting directives. Uh, do I have that motion? Yes. Have that motion from Linda and Ray has a second. Roll call. Trustee Cook? Yes. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Gaten? Yes. Trustee Henning? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. Hope vacation's going well. Thank you. I found spring. Oh, very good. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> All right, that moves us to Heber and Grange District. Uh, who's going to lead that? So I'll start, and then we have uh, Ed and uh, Val here this evening, and Val prepared some of the comments, and we met as a team uh, based on where we last left with the um, intergovernmental agreement that was prepared and sent over to the Heber and Grange District and, and never was executed. We took the opportunity to clarify a few other things that needed to be placed in some of the recitals relative to communication, you know, protocols of how they would operate, and then uh, future funding, uh, should that be necessary, and how that process would work. Um, before we actually had legal review it, we basically, uh, and now you can speak to, I think did a very nice job of capturing everything that had it prior had been looked at. Um, get some feedback from the board here, and then we can meet with the Hebron Drainage District, get their feedback, and hopefully we can um, discuss any issues that they have and then move forward to having an agreement executed by both parties. So tonight, it's just to get your feedback on the recitals, any concerns, and we can make those changes. So Val has some things he's going to present, or? No, or, no I mean, I'll just mention, we did this like five years ago right. originally, and then I was asked to look at it again and maybe update, revise some new thinking that has come into play since that time. And so the, the primary, um, not going through the document in my hands right now, but um, the primary things that we thought were relevant to mention at this time were, like Elizabeth mentioned, let's clear up the communication channel so that it makes clear that a phone call to whoever picks up the phone here really wasn't what we were looking for. We were looking for some formal communication. So we just established it between Elizabeth and then whoever on their side would be written. And so that there would be a, a good understanding of, of what each party was doing and expecting. The other primary um, thing that we, we thought was relevant to, to mention was how we were handling uh, assessments or fees related to uh, activities in that within that drainage district. You know, we have recently received a billing for an invoice for activities and, and, and work done there. Uh, I think it's the first that we had ever encountered as a, you know, from, from sure. that drainage district. So um, we did um, cite in there uh, a you know, part of the statute from the Conservation District Act that, that says that the Conservation District shall not be subject to special assessments from other units of government. Um, that's a position that, you know, may be debatable or has not been tested in, in, in the law, but um, we thought it's relevant that to take a position that we, it's there, it reads, it's very plain. So, uh, and so, but that's not to say that we were, wouldn't be willing to work and be cooperative and, 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 you know, with regard to special assessments. And so there's a, also a mechanism that's been put in there where if there are activities where they are expecting some participation, from the district that we can inform the goals, have a chance to review the plans, uh, including what the assessments would be, and then um, approve them in advance um, as a as kind of a just an understanding that a voluntary agreement to participate on on certain projects within the, the district without um, making it a uh, adversarial situation. I think the drainage district may take into may feel that they have the right to assess. Oh, I, I agree. So I think you're gonna have quite the discussion on that. Because I think I oh I think oh to say the least. Because uh, I think they're gonna say the law is on their side to be able to do that. And you're gonna say that our 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 thought is that they need to they need to have a discussion. So I well, think they feel that they have the right to assess anything within their district. No, I, I'm sure that they would probably say that and not even maybe read it and say and say that, you know. But so so my my thinking was, I mean, I was asked to put something together, right. got some input and say, well, 
this is these are the elephants in the room here. This right. is what this says very clearly. So, but but I think it, it could be, you know, we try to put a positive spit on it and say, this is what this says. But in light of that, despite that, it says that if you want us to work on something and if there's some beneficial, let's let's we'll pay for it. We'll pay for our share if it's a benefit to what we have. So we're trying to make it a, a positive way of, of looking at it and not saying, no, we won't pay assessments. We'll say, and then, and then we don't have to get to that debate on whether we have to or not, hopefully. And they may come up with their own whereas is it based on the conservation, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the drainage district law, and the two are there. And so we're not debating that. You know, I think it frames it to move forward, I guess, with something. I think that they had a drainage, the state had a drainage district or a drainage meeting um, a week or two ago. I think that they did bring this up to the state drainage, whatever the title of that organization is. I think they were going to research it because I don't think they've had that discussion of how they're going to work with another government entity. So um, I think they're they're looking at it from their side also. So I think they should have a good discussion, good intelligent discussion from both sides soon. Yeah, I would I would add to this too that it it um, I, it identifies a methodology. <clears throat> for the drainage commissioners to enter the property to do drainage inspections. And I think that was very important to them. So it's it's codified how they can do that, with where they would park. And uh, it also goes into um, into the responsibilities of and and benefits that both the drainage district and the conservation district has for our particular missions. So I think in, in the document it tries to follow the fact that there are drainage concerns. They have to be addressed in their conservation concerns that need to be addressed. I think all of us are really hoping that this is a, a good jumping off point to have a kind of a very ideal relationship that maybe could become a model. I think we're heading in that direction. So there'll be more of them to work with. So I think that's good. Of course, each, each one will bring its own personalities. So there's that also. That's what makes it so interesting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Anyone else on the board have anything? No, I think you know, uh, as difficult as it may be to come to some type of agreement, it's important that an agreement be reached and that the, the uh, proposal just not sit for five more years until uh, some other uh, issue that brings it to the fore. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think the discussion should. A continue in a cooperative, positive way. Um, and at some point, if we need legal representation, then, you know, we need to uh, be sure we're properly represented. Anyone else? So next steps, if this is good, then we'll just volley it over and we'll continue back on. I know the drainage district is looking to have a meeting and uh, when they're ready, we can send it over. Uh, they can take a look at it and get together and we can explain it. You know. We're gonna send this over now as it is, right? If you have no changes, we'll right. send it. And um, and then we have a meeting so we can kind of right. discuss they it. They can look it over and then we can get a meeting put together. And, you know. Sounds good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for the effort into that. I'm sure it'll be a good discussion going forward. All right, with that, we're going to move on to the executive director's report. Okay, a few things here for everyone. We were down in Springfield for Parks Day, and it was great to be back in the Capitol with business as usual, and the legislators were happy to see us back in play. It's very busy. Uh, just to give an overlook, the total number of bills, IEPD was telling that there was 9,902 bills that were introduced this legislative session, 2,449 amendments to that. And at the time when we were down there, there was 1,070 bills that were currently being tracked um, of interest and concern. So it was a really busy place. Um, so a lot that was going on down there. Um, during the conference, they had Dr. Kent Redfield, um, who was Professor Emeritus at Political Science for University of Illinois. And he talked about just the general, uh, how politics really works and how it's changed. And of course, at that time, 
we were down there when a lot of big newspaper headlines were taking place the themes of just the culture and the money and the structure and how all of this stuff is a systematic piece and kind of where we're going forward and with all the reforms and all the activities that are taking place thus are putting a lot of uh, local efforts and local level uh, which is is why one of the things that you're seeing with your economic statement of economic interest uh, with the new change there that you updated, things that you need to disclose, et cetera, a little bit more of a deeper dive than you may have had in the past. So just a reminder to complete that. That did go out, but there were some issues at the- It's up to date. It's, it's up to date, yes, yeah. yes. It's a, yeah, online. And online, so you can do that. So that's one of the changes, but it was very interesting um, to, to what has been going on and some of the changes down there. They also talked about cybersecurity and uh, with our IT team, Stephanie at the lead and Andy, and then with Concentric, making sure that we're on top of all of the situation um, for concerns. And so Steph has placed out through the Derma uh, for us to put together a business continuity plan and incident response plan. So we did that during COVID to see how deep in different areas of operation, but now we're looking to see if in fact we were under a cybersecurity attack what it's going to take. If all systems go down and they have to come in and uh, whether it be held at a ransomware or whether it's just we have a virus that's infiltrated our system, how do we operate if everybody can have access to their laptops and smartphones and everything like that. So we're going through a critical eye and mapping that all out just to ensure that we've got the necessary protections. The investments that the district has made through um, moving to cloud-based systems like we did with our email server in other areas, um, that just adds another layer so that should something happen, you can get access to that data sooner. So it's really the items that are on our um, server locally in our facilities, and that's another discussion is, is we need to make investments going forward, looking at cloud-based systems even to install our server material. That just is a way to mitigate some of that and, and transfer that risk. So, so that was talked about. Um, the FAP 420 vacation, um, we did draft a resolution we attended last month to the county board, and then we will also be presenting um, their moving a resolution forward. I shared that with this afternoon. And anybody that's interested, um, on the 30th, it'll be in front of the Transportation Committee, and then on hopefully the county board in April. Uh, and that formal communication will then be sent on to Springfield and getting your support to assist us in having that transfer. Let's see here what else we talk about. The environmental defenders. Um, LACAG is having, um, if anybody's interested, April 27th um, is an invite for anyone that wants to attend. And then there are some uh, dates that have not been assigned. So if we're interested in hosting one of the LACAGs in the future, that would be something that we might want to take an opportunity to do. Um, the other piece I want to talk with you tonight was the um, letter for support for Bell Bowl. The district has been approached uh, several times via email to join the group that's signing on to that letter. Uh, if you're familiar, if you've read in the newspaper, uh, the airport and a uh, query uh, that is on the Illinois Nature Natural Areas Inventory site uh, is under threat. Um, at this point, the district has not responded or signed on. My review of it, that there are no other governmental entities that have signed on it. And I go back when we look at these things. Um, I look at our threats and response to public notice procedure, and since this is not an independent county, um, unless the board directs differently, I guess I'd be looking to your feedback. It would not be something that would be, at this point, something for us to step up. I think I'm comfortable with that if it's not in our backyard or purview. <clears throat> that we should officially um, get involved. There's a lot of uh, organizations, uh, alliances that are taking positions on this where there are members and there's support and the sign on list is, is pretty significant. Um, and we're a link to those organizations as well. Without that, but I think a lot of the government alliances would probably find themselves in that. Well, if we want the Rockford Airport people to start telling us what to do then in other words if you open if, what's fair place? for one is fair for, for the other so i mean i i might support prairie preservation as a private citizen but i'm not sure that it's just my 
point of view that the district should take an official position. I, I, I feel the same way. Um, I personally do support it, but I don't know that we we should as the Henry County Conservation District. I'm on board with that as well. It looks like that's the consensus of the board that we will just at this point in time not, not sign on with anything. Okay, and that is all that I have. And then uh, the last piece I will say, Conservation Congress, save the date, that is a board meeting. So we need everybody there. Um, registration is ongoing, numbers are looking good. Um, everything's being finalized and it's just a couple weeks away. So the date is? So April 6th, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. at McHenry County College. And uh, thank you, President Henning and Vice President Cook, you participated in our planning group meetings. And, uh, is, is there something that's going to be given to all the board members, or would you like to be uh, That would be great. I can prepare something for you just to remind everybody to sign up. Uh, Chairman Bueller is also going to be making open remarks, and we can met with him uh, to talk about that too. So, yeah, I will prepare something and we can do that. We'd love to have right. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Many assignments and reports. Uh, Fox River. I don't know if we have anybody attending that this time. Anyone? Kishwaukee. Uh, yes, yeah, so we met uh, March 4th, um, earlier this month. Um, the main uh, presentation this month was regarding uh, gas and oil lines that run through uh, portions of. Uh, McHenry County and specifically the Kish River uh, corridor, um, where uh, I guess there have been a few leaks in the past and um, things like that. And they're working uh, with, uh, God, I can't remember the name of the agency, one of the uh, water preservation agencies uh, the, in Illinois to uh, figure out whether we have any sort of action plan if there were some type of rupture or leak, uh, how that affects the water system. Um, and that, uh, you know, I guess a, a lot of the, the lines run through, uh, there was one particular gentleman on the call who ran through his property and said that, you know, he didn't even know that they had an easement through there and things like that. And so um, it was a very informative uh, meeting, um, but yeah, that's what the, when you said they had leaks, did you mean they had leaks actually in the water? Or they just had a leak someplace else, and they were concerned that they may be in the water. They, uh, they they spoke about they had specific leaks down towards like Romeoville Joliet area of the pipeline, uh, but that same pipeline you know runs from okay, but it up hasn't north actually it hasn't been, hasn't it happened been. here yet. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Chicago Wilderness. The only update, our next meeting, uh, Executive Council will be in April. Currently, we're reviewing uh, branding communication firms to launch and promote the Green Vision. There have been several cafes, very interesting on roads and a variety of different activities that are happening across the region. Uh, for those that take part, those programs are free and are all done online. And then we'll continue with uh, uh, city conservation. There's some more programs left for that series, and then that will be. IACFPD, IAPD, and NRPA. There's no Farm Bureau, that's not here. Yeah, I have no new information to report uh, from those organizations. Okay. Conservation Foundation, uh, you were at their meeting. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Linda, and I didn't make it. I can, I can tell you what. Okay, well, you can tell me what. I mean, they have. As you said, there was no consensus on the 14th, so they did a meeting last night. Um, the, they wanted to accept the financial audit for the year end, June 30th, 2021, acceptance of the fiscal year 2021 federal form 990, and um, a new member, foundation member, Elise Livingston, got her application in. So the first two were accepted, and and passed, and um, we're going to bring that up 
that applicant applicant's name to us when he broke in April. So very good. Yeah. Anything else? No, I, I will also say uh, Wendy Coomer and our marketing team, Caitlin and Daddy, were there to provide how our communications team is supporting and advancing the work of the foundation. Um, it's unfortunate that more members weren't present to hear it, hear it, but it was recorded, so they'll be able to watch it. But uh, I think the strategy and seeing how our using networks and some potential of rebranding the foundation was discussed as, as an opportunity and uh, hopefully by those efforts being very targeted we'll continue to build that momentum of additional dollars being raised by the foundation and showing that the two organizations are working with that and paddle paddle saddle june the weekend 11th. before father's day yes the 11th i think it's the 11th mm -hmm. father's day is the 19th so I'll give you that mm -hmm. let's see here I think it's the 12th. It's the 12th. Same weekend, but it's Sunday. Here it is. It's the weekend before Father's Day. You're right. So that's coming up. Um, move it on that. Okay. I will not be in town. I think they're looking for sponsorship to help with that program, yeah. volunteers on the day of. Um, that's, they're trying to move that so it's more, more than a friend raiser. Right. Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, kind of council of governments. Mm -hmm. Hey, green drinks. Okay, I'll say about green drinks is green drinks is being canceled for April because of the Congress. So they're mm -hmm. uh, channeling all of that activity. Okay, uh, John, the bicycle and pedestrian plan. There was uh, no media, so no report. Okay, thank you. Nat naturally, McHenry County. So we had our brand launch at the Bill Mansion. It was an amazing event. Um, we had both from the state tourism. Um, Senator Wilcox was president, chairman Brewer, a lot of the county board members uh, come to visit to could speak to that. It just, it was very exciting to see the momentum of the synergy of the three areas work together. The destination marketing organization we talked about before, the county of McHenry, and then the economic development corporation and this ability that everybody working together and what sets us apart. Um, we did have a board meeting last week. Uh, looking at what we need to be doing. If you've seen that insider guide, um, I should have brought one up. Um, they are available. Again, great promotional material to advertise what there is to, if you're living here, what you can see and take part of. If you're from outside the area, what you can come and visit from. And so that is being well received. And then um, we're looking at some next steps of what we need to do to. Um, Again, increase impressions. Um, I will say that National Center County is working as a partner with us for the Conservation Congress in taking the app um, they created with site destinations. So, and then a, a challenge so that you'll be able to check in to a conservation district area, visit a local restaurant or a business, and then get points and then be able to, to go for a drawing. So, we're trying to connect that tourism component of the two of us working collaboratively, again, building with the foundation as a way to build those business-to-business -business partnerships too. So, is that, are those right there? Those are them, yes. Yeah, so, okay. They were really well. I haven't seen it here, so I think it's working. Okay. Well, you've seen these, right? So, that's the guy. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else have any other outreach contacts this time? They'd like to report. If not, then we'll move on to public comments. Two, Stephanie, anyone out there that would like to comment? No, there, there is no one. Okay, thank you. Well, we have no executive session, so with that, I would take a motion to adjourn. We'll make that motion. Who has a motion to adjourn or second? Ray has the second. A roll call, please. Trustee Pope? Yes. Trustee Thomas? Yes. Trustee Hayden? Yes. Trustee Hayden? Yes. Motion carries and we are adjourned. Thanks.
Thank you to everyone that came and uh, helped put this meeting together.